Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. We have an article on the front page of the Delhi edition which refers to an orchid which was recently discovered in the state of Assam. This orchid was discovered by accident by a forest officer of the state forest department of Assam and it is considered to be a variant of the oriental orchid which is also found in Japan, Taiwan and Laos. So that's the reason why this orchid has been named as the Leka Norcus Taiwaniana. And the most interesting feature about this orchid is that it is a parasitic plant which cannot carry out the process of photosynthesis. So it has been classified as a mycoheterotroph and this topic can be very important for prelims. So before we understand what a mycoheterotroph is, we need to understand the difference between an autotroph and a heterotroph. An autotroph is an organism which can produce its own energy through the process of photosynthesis. So an autotroph can produce its own complex organic compounds by drawing energy from sunlight in order to carry out the process of photosynthesis. It also carries out carbon fixation through which carbon dioxide is absorbed into the organism. This is an essential ingredient for the process of photosynthesis as well. And the autotroph will also draw all the essential nutrients and water from the soil system. So the energy produced by an autotroph forms the very foundation of an ecosystem because this is the first source of energy upon which the entire food chain is dependent upon. So as a result, an autotroph is also referred to as a primary producer. On the other hand, an heterotroph cannot produce its own energy and it cannot carry out photosynthesis. So heterotrophs draw their energy and nutrients by directly consuming the autotroph or the primary producer. So as a result, heterotrophs are also known as consumers and they are in turn classified into primary consumer, secondary consumer and tertiary consumer. So now let us understand what is mycoheterotrophy. Mycoheterotrophy represents a symbiotic relationship between a non-photosynthetic plant and a fungi. A symbiotic relationship represents a mutually dependent relationship that is both the parties are giving something and they are taking something in return. And in the case of mycoheterotrophy, we have a non-photosynthetic plant which is drawing its energy and nutrients by depending upon a fungus or a fungi. Basically, this non-photosynthetic plant is acting as a parasite to draw the energy and nutrients which is needed by directly depending upon a fungus. And this fungus in return would be dependent upon a photosynthetic plant or a producer because at the end of the day, fungi belongs to the category of heterotrophs. Fungi depends upon a photosynthetic plant for drawing energy and nutrients and in return, you have a non-photosynthetic plant which is drawing energy and nutrients by depending upon the fungi. So this relationship is known as mycoheterotrophy. That is a non-photosynthetic plant being dependent upon fungus for drawing energy and nutrients. And the article also says that this orchid might possess certain herbal and medicinal properties which will be studied in the coming days. And with regard to orchid population in India, there are around 1300 species which are found in the country. Out of these 1300 species, around 800 of them are found in the northeast of India, around 300 are found in the western Ghats, and the remaining 200 are found in the northwestern part of Himalayas. So this geographical distribution of orchids in India can be important for prelims. And the article also mentions a couple of other medicinal plants which can be relevant for prelims. The article mentions Costus pictus, which is also referred to as the insulin plant because it is used in treating diabetes mellitus. And the article also mentions the O. mungus, which is used in treating cancer because of the alkaloid camptothecin, which is used in the production of anti-cancer drugs. So kindly note down these medicinal plants which can be relevant for prelims and let us also talk about the role of fungi in the ecosystem. 
just like animals and plants fungi is also classified as a separate kingdom and it presents a number of advantages and disadvantages with regard to its role in the ecosystem a fungi is not only a heterotroph but it can also act as a decomposer it secretes certain enzymes which can actually play a major role in the process of decomposition of organic matter and as a result fungi plays a primary role in nutrient cycling and in the exchange of nutrients in the environment fungi also serves as a direct source of human food it is consumed in various forms such as mushrooms truffles it is used in the production of bread and the enzymes produced by fungi is used in fermentation of various food products such as wine beer soy sauce etc and these enzymes are also used in the production of antibiotics and in various industries especially in the production of detergents certain fungi can also be used as biological pesticides to control the growth of weeds plant diseases and insect pests and it can also be used to combat pollution especially water pollution and such a technique is referred to as mycofiltration mycofiltration is the technique of using certain types of fungus in order to treat polluted water and make it fit for consumption and some of the disadvantages of fungi is that it produces mycotoxins which is a bioactive compound which can be highly toxic to both animals and human beings it also produces certain psychotropic substances which is consumed for recreational purposes and in some traditional spiritual ceremonies and the abuse of these psychotropic substances can easily result in a unhealthy addiction next fungi can also cause significant damage to buildings and materials it can also be treated as a pathogen due to its toxicity against humans and animals few types of fungi can also destroy agricultural productivity because they can cause fungal diseases such as the rice blast disease and due to its role in decomposition it can spoil the food stocks which can have a huge impact on food security and as well as on the economy now let's take up the next article the chief minister of odisha mr navin patnaik has demanded the special category status to odisha the chief minister has said that odisha deserves the special category status because the state is hit with multiple natural disasters every single year over the last 5 years odisha has been hit by major cyclones including cyclone phileen cyclone hudhud cyclone titli and now cyclone fani and the state is also affected by floods and as a result these natural disasters are having a major impact against the infrastructure of the state the frequent damage of infrastructure caused by natural disasters is having a direct impact on the growth and development status of odisha and the relief funds which are provided by the center through the national disaster response fund is insufficient because these funds are only useful for carrying out a temporary restoration of infrastructure so the chief minister has argued that if the damaged infrastructure has to be rebuilt permanently and if the state has to be made disaster resilient then odisha should be given the status of special category state so in this context let us understand what do you mean by the special category status the concept of special category status was first introduced by the fifth finance commission in 1969 because the finance commission felt that there was a huge regional divide in india as far as development was concerned the finance commission felt that few states suffered from a inherent disadvantage due to its geography and its location so the finance commission said that such disadvantaged states should be given preferential treatment in the form of additional central assistance and tax breaks so this concept was discussed by the national development council which is chaired by the prime minister and it involves participation of all the chief ministers of the state and the task for working out the criteria for granting special category status and as well as the task of designing the formula for allocation of funds was given to the planning commission by the national development council so the then planning commission which was headed by mr gadgil came out with a formula which is popularly referred to as the gadgil formula 
So according to this formula, states which have a geographical disadvantage and socio-economic disadvantage, they should be provided preferential treatment because these states have a very low resource base and they cannot mobilize adequate resources for growth and development. So the features needed for the categorization of a state under the special category status included the presence of hilly and difficult terrain, low population density or a significant tribal population and a state can be granted the special category status if it shares a strategic location along international borders with India's neighboring countries, if it has economic and infrastructural backwardness and if it does not have adequate finances in order to promote growth and development. So based on this criteria, a formula was developed by the Gardgill Committee which came to be known as the Gardgill Formula. So based on this criteria and formula, initially three states were given the special category status which included Assam, Nagaland and Jammu and Kashmir. Later, eight more states have been given the special category status and this includes Arunachal Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Sikkim, Tripura and most recently Uttarakhand. And later, the Gadgil formula was revised and updated by the Planning Commission which was then headed by Pranam Mukherjee and this formula came to be known as the Gadgil Mukherjee formula. And this formula decided the allocation of central funds to the state and this practice continued until 2014 when the planning commission was abolished. Before 2014, there were two routes through which the central funds would be devolved to the states. On one hand, we had the finance commission which is a constitutional body which would work out the formula for devolution of central funds to the states and on the other hand, we had the Planning Commission, which was a non-constitutional body, which was deciding upon the devolution of funds, which were a part of central assistance that was given to the states. And this devolution of central assistance was carried out by the Planning Commission on the basis of the Gardgill formula and later the Gardgill Mukherjee formula. But in 2014, the Planning Commission was completely abolished and it was replaced by the Niti Aayog. And since then, the devolution of central funds to the states is entirely decided on the basis of the recommendations of the 14th Finance Commission. So since the recommendations of the 14th Finance Commission were accepted, the Gardgill formula has been discontinued and right now, the Niti Aayog does not have any powers to decide upon the devolution of central assistance to the states. So in order to compensate for this loss of central assistance, which was earlier coming from the Planning Commission, the 14th Finance Commission increase the devolution of funds from 32% to 42%. So since these recommendations of the 14th Finance Commission was accepted by the central government in 2015, the status of special category has been effectively removed. So the center has said that no other state can be given the special category status. But over the last few years, a number of states have been raising the demand for a special category status. This includes Andhra Pradesh, Bihar and as well as Odisha. Odisha is demanding the special category status because the state is hit by multiple natural disasters every year. Bihar is demanding the status due to its low socio-economic development and Andhra Pradesh is demanding the status because the state was bifurcated very recently to form Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Now let's take up the next article. Kerala has come up with a new disaster management plan based on the valuable lessons the state has learnt during Cyclone Okchi and the 2018 floods. The Kerala State Disaster Management Authority has laid down a set of standard operating procedures which have to be implemented to deal with both natural disasters and as well as man-made disasters. These standard operating procedures define the emergency preparedness measures and it also provides for an emergency response plan which has to be implemented at the state level, at the district level and as well as at the taluk level. This document has clearly defined the roles of the state departments, the central agencies and as well as the district authorities. So this disaster management manual has been titled as the Orange Book of Disaster Management. It was earlier known as the Handbook on Disaster Management 
and the updated disaster management plan comprehensively covers a variety of natural and man-made disasters. It has laid down specific emergency preparedness measures and emergency response plan for heavy rainfall, floods, cyclones, tsunamis, high waves, landslides and even industrial disasters such as petrochemical accidents and it even covers space debris such as meteorites and falling components of spacecrafts. The disaster management plan has a special focus for the monsoon rainfall which is received by the state. It has clearly defined the responsibilities of the state departments, the central agencies and the district authorities which have to be implemented during the southwest monsoon season and as well as during the northeast monsoon season. And the new disaster management plan has been designed to be season specific depending on the threat level. The plan will also be reviewed and updated constantly. In fact, the State Disaster Management Authority plans to update this document every year based on the long-range forecast which will be provided by the Indian Meteorological Department. Now let's take up the next article. We have an article on page 5 which refers to the Kolam tribe in Telangana which enjoys the status of particularly vulnerable tribal group. This tribal community in Adilabad is gripped by a sense of fear after the death of three children which was actually caused by food poisoning. But this tribal community which is always driven by orthodoxy, tradition and rituals has taken up a superstitious belief that these deaths have been caused by an evil force. So right now they are consulting with the local priests and based on their advice the whole community is looking to relocate from the Adilabad district. In fact, such superstitious beliefs is not uncommon to the Kolam tribe. In the last few decades, the tribe has relocated to multiple locations whenever such inexplicable deaths were occurring within the community. Instead of following the scientific advice provided by the health officials and the government officials, the community would relocate to a new location in order to escape from the so-called evil force. So this constant relocation based on superstition has had a socio-economic impact on the tribal community and this clearly highlights the significance of promoting education and greater awareness amongst the tribal community. So let us also discuss some of the basic facts about the Kolam tribe which can be important for prelims. The Kolam tribe enjoys the scheduled tribe tag in Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. After the state was split, they are found in both Andhra Pradesh and Telangana as well and they enjoy the status of particularly vulnerable tribal group. They speak the Kolami language and it is predominantly an agricultural community. And the Kolam tribe is an endogamous group which means they always marry within their social group or within their community. And this tribe is also highly vulnerable to thalassemia, which is a type of an inherited blood disorder caused by abnormal hemoglobin production. Next, we have an image on page 6, which depicts the open bill stork at the Nandan Kanan Zoological Park in Bhuvaneshwar. We recently spoke about the Nandan Kanan Zoological Park in Bhuvaneshwar after the impact of Cyclone Fani. Now let us talk about the open bill stork which can be important for prelims. The open bill stork is a large wading bird which is generally found in wetland ecosystems. It is characterized by a large bill and it usually feeds on mollusks such as snails, mussels, etc. And there are two species of open bill storks. This includes the Asian open bill and the African open bill. And the main distinguishing feature between the two is that the African open bill has fringes formed out of plate-like structures in the roof of its upper bill. This is completely absent in the Asian open bill. And if you look at the range, the African open bill is native to sub-Saharan Africa, whereas the Asian open bill is found in the Indian subcontinent and as well as in Southeast Asia. These birds are generally resident birds which means they are native to their particular range and they are generally non-migratory, they do not move over large distances. But in response to adverse weather and lack of food availability, 
they are known to make long distance movements and finally their iucn status is that of least concern now let's take up an editorial from page number 8 the editorial substantive equality deals with the controversial topic of reservation in promotions recently the karnataka state assembly had passed a legislation to preserve the consequential seniority of sc and st candidates who have been promoted on the basis of reservation but this legislation had been challenged at the supreme court on the grounds that reservation in promotions will have a direct impact on administrative efficiency so the supreme court which was looking into the case recently delivered a historic judgment which has upheld the legislation passed by the karnataka state assembly by stating that the legislation has satisfied all the parameters and principles which were laid down in the nagaraj case of 2006 it has also satisfied the principles of the jarnail singh case of 2018 and the legislation is also in line with the indra samni case of 1992 so the supreme court was satisfied that the legislation passed by the karnataka state assembly was in line with the principles laid down by the supreme court in these three cases and the supreme court has also said that providing reservation in promotions does not compromise administrative efficiency the karnataka state assembly had passed a similar legislation in 2002 but this law was struck down by the court on the ground that there was inadequate data to justify reservation in promotions later in 2006 through the nagaraj case the supreme court had laid down a set of guidelines which were to be followed by the karnataka state assembly in drafting such a legislation so as per these guidelines which were established through the nagaraj case the karnataka government had constituted a committee to collect data on three aspects related to the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes this included the extent of backwardness of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes the inadequacy of their representation in the government services and as well as to study the impact of reservation in promotions on administrative efficiency so based on the recommendations of this committee the karnataka government had drafted a new legislation in order to protect and preserve consequential seniority of sc st candidates who have been promoted on the basis of reservation so when this legislation was challenged at the supreme court the supreme court has rejected the claims of the petitioner and it has upheld the law because the law has been drafted based on the data which has been collected by this committee and this is according to the guidelines prescribed by the court in the nagaraj case and recently in the jarnail singh case of 2018 the supreme court said that there was no need to establish the backwardness of sc st communities in india because it is a established fact that the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes have been historically oppressed in india so through the supreme court judgment the supreme court eliminated the need to establish the backwardness of sc st communities through data collection so this requirement of the nagaraj case was struck down by the supreme court through the jarnail singh judgment and right now by upholding the legislation passed by the state assembly of karnataka the supreme court has also rejected the argument that reservation in promotions can have an impact on administrative efficiency so even the third guideline of the nagaraj case has been struck down by the supreme court itself because the supreme court is of the opinion that merit lies not only in performance but also in achieving social goals such as equality which is a guaranteed fundamental right under the indian constitution and a true sense of equality can only be achieved by providing adequate quotas and reservations to socially oppressed communities such as the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes so basically through these judgments the supreme court has provided the historical justification and the social justification which is needed to enable reservation in promotions and going forward the only requirement to provide for reservation in promotion is to collect data only with regard to the inadequacy of representation of scs and sts in government services now let's take up the practice questions which of the following categorization is appropriate for the vulture the correct answer is option d scavenger
Now let's look at the second question. Which of the following is not a category on the IUCN red list? The correct answer is option C, threatened. Because we do not have a category known as threatened, but we do have a category known as near threatened. Now let's take up the third question. Which of the following statements are correct? The domestic yak is a long-haired domesticated bovid found throughout the Himalayan region of the Indian subcontinent. It is also found in the Tibetan plateau and as far north as Mongolia and Russia. This is a correct statement with regard to the domestic yak. It does not have an IUCN status because it is a domesticated species. This is again a correct statement. Because domesticated species are not listed on the IUCN red list. Whereas the wild yak is listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. This is again a correct statement. So option D is the right answer. Now let's take up a map based question. Burkina Faso shares a boundary with which of the following countries? Burkina Faso shares a boundary with Mali and Niger. So option C is the correct answer. Please look at this map. The neighboring countries of Burkina Faso includes Mali, Niger, Benin, Togo, Ghana and Ivory Coast. Now let's take up a question from the 2015 prelims paper. Which of the following statements regarding the Green Climate Fund is or are correct? It is intended to assist the developing countries in adaptation and mitigation practices to counter climate change. It is founded under the aegis of the UN Environment Programme OECD, Asian Development Bank and the World Bank. The first statement is correct but the second statement is wrong because the Green Climate Fund has been established under the Climate Change Convention. So option A is the correct answer. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.